Hello and welcome to another World War II podcast. Last year I talked to Greg Lewis about female agents in the British Special Operations Executive, SOE, who Churchill tasked with setting Europe ablaze. In this episode we'll be looking specifically at Diana Rowden, who was flown into France in 1943. But before we start to all those patrons of the show, if you head over to Patreon, you'll find Gabriella and I talking about her husband, who is now 97 and flew missions for SOE during the war. If you're on the mailing list uh, because you support the show via PayPal, you should find the link in your mailbox. If you're interested in becoming a patron, head over to patreon.com slash WW2 podcast. By agreeing to a dollar or so a month, you'll help me find the time to put the show together. I'm a one-man band, so every dollar helps me put more time into the show. So that's patreon.com slash WW2podcast, or go to WW2podcast.com and click on donate. So I'm joined by Gabrielle uh, McDonald rothwell uh, Gabriella's book, Her Finest Hour, The Heroic Life of Diana Rowden, Wartime Secret Agent, takes the reader through Diana's life. Thanks for joining me. Um, we're going to be looking in detail at Diana, um, but before we start on her wartime service, can we look at her background? Um, I suspect many people will wonder who these women of the SOE were. I mean, Diana isn't French and she doesn't have a, a French background. So um, wh where does her family come from? Well, Diana came from an illustrious and extended family of army officers, clerics and lawyers, including a, a, king council, a king's council on her father's side. So in um, official documents that I have seen, they're described variously as chaplain, vicar, clergyman and, and lawyer. In other words, she was out of the top drawer. Now, there has been no reference to any... Um, going as far back as possible, nothing to do with France. But to me, the fact that I researched her early days, what happened was that her mother and father separated when Diana was, was very young. And her mother was a very strong, independent woman, fortunate enough to be unencumbered with a regular job. Now, when the marriage broke up, at that time, which would be around about the early 1920s, roughly. I couldn't get the exact year when they moved to France, but, but Diana told people that she was about seven when she went to France, which, which um, as she was born in, in 1915, which would obviously be about 1922, 1923. And the reason why um, Diana and her two brothers were brought up mainly in France was because Mrs. Rowden, like many other British people of means in the years between the two world wars, she knew that a small income would go further in France than in England because at that time the value of the British currency was high. She herself had holidayed in the south of France before her marriage and she saw it as a wonderfully multicultural place to bring up the children to say nothing of the favourable climate. So in the early 1920s, uh, the family sailed from Tilbury Docks for the French Riviera. They rented villas in uh, saint jean um, saint uh, cap Fra and Monton on the Italian-French border, which they used as a base. Monton was always known as La Pearl de la France, the Pearl of France, and it was a popular destination for wealthy English and Russian people, um, many of whom had built luxurious hotels and, and uh, villas. So they lived in the south of France for some years, and Diana later told friends that she was about seven at the time they left England and that from the very start she was sublimely happy. Uh, shortly after the, their arrival, Mrs. Rowden quickly befriended and hired an Italian, Vin Vincenzo, and they bought an old yacht which they aptly named Somme Peur. Surely <laughs> a revelation for the future because Diana is always known um, as, as another name, Somme Peur, without fear. So it was a wonderful childhood. 
the childhood friend that Diana was later to meet when they returned to England was a woman called Elizabeth Nicholas. Years later, uh, Mrs. Rowden would speak to Elizabeth Nicholas and she would describe those days, telling her that Diana used to sleep on deck with a line tied around her big toe to wake her should it be jerked by a fish. And she gutted fish and she learned how to sail a boat. So it was a wonderful Wonderful life for these three children. Diana had two younger brothers, Morris and Kit. And uh, so they had a carefree life. They really went to school only only during the odd time in uh, winter. So can you imagine children nowadays unencumbered with the burden of, of going to school, but they could go fishing and sailing and playing on the beach all day, what a wonderful life. And it had the advantage of the fact that they grew up to be trilingual. They could speak not only English, but Italian and French with a good smattering of Spanish. So Mrs. Rowden, strangely enough, seems to have been an eccentric woman. And the locals picked this up, calling her the mad English English woman. The children attracted attention, especially on Sundays when they attended Mass wearing their kilts. And this is another thing about Diana too, that she was very, very proud of um, the Scottish background because Mrs. Rowden, although she was born in in England, uh, Middlesex, just out of London, as, as you'd know, she came, her, her parents were all born in Scotland, Diana's grandparents and Diana's great-grandparents on her mother's side, they had all come from Scotland. So that was the background to Diana. Now, when it got to about uh, 1930, Mrs. Rowden, for some reason, realized that the children were growing up without the benefit of a solid background of schooling. So she decided that there was nothing for it but to return to England with the children. And of course, the children bucked against this, but they were unsuccessful in persuading their mother that the time had come. So the idyll couldn't last, and so they were packed up and they set sail for England. The children, still without a father figure, but benefiting from their mother's strong character, had failed um, a determined Mrs. Rowden. They returned to England in the latter part of 1929, a country cold, grey and damp, on the verge of a depression, and they settled in Hadlow Down, a beautiful village in Mayfield in East Sussex. And eventually, Diana started at a school called the Manor House School in Lims- Limsfield, Surrey. So that's her early background, Angus. It, it, it's interesting that uh, it, it, it is, that, I, I was going to say, f- uh, upper middle class, fading out aristocracy sort of background that I guess, as, as, as we'll see, Many of Aristocratic these, background. Yeah. Many of these people seem to have been uh, drawn from. Now, what I found incredible, I mean, that it, it, there's so much to Diana's story. Before, you know, and, and one of those things that I found amazing was she was in her, her is it, there was the whole family, or was it her and her mother were in, back in France, living in Paris when it fell in 1940? Yes. As soon as uh, Diana left the Manor House School, there was one thing on her mind, and that was to return to France as soon as possible, because all through her most unhappy secondary school life in in, uh, the Manor House, the only friend she made was this woman, well, Elizabeth Nicholas, but all she wanted to do was to return to France. So her brothers, slightly younger, two or three years younger than herself, they were at school in Lansing, the school in... Sussex somewhere, apparently still going nowadays, a very, very good school for boys. So her mother and Diana returned to France. Diana enrolled at the Sorbonne to study languages, and she graduated in Paris. She would have graduated in probably 1936. And, of course, at that stage, the writing was on the wall with uh, what Hitler was doing in Germany. So when, towards 1938, it uh, was obvious that that war was going to break out very soon. And when, just before Paris was was invaded, obviously the war had started the year before in in, uh, 1939, Diana and her mother were 
amongst some of the last English people who were caught up in amongst the hundreds of um, maybe several thousand British people living in France who had to escape back to England, knowing that if they were found, they would have been put put in a camp, as uh, many were the ones that did indeed refuse, either refuse to leave France or else were, were most unlucky, the ones who were rounded up. So they had a very, very hard time escaping. Now, unbeknown to Mrs. Rowden, Diana had absolutely no intentions of going with her to England. So she stayed as long as possible, but she must have persuaded her mother that she would go with her because she knew that Mrs. Rowden would refuse to leave without her daughter. So the two of them joined the throng going down to Bordeaux. Now, before this, when when it was obvious that, that France was going to be invaded and just before that, Diana had, um, she had trained to be a nurse. She had, all she wanted to do was to help remaining evaders like the leftover um, men from Dunkirk who, who were trying to escape back to England. She had joined an escape line. She had successfully enabled a lot of people to return back to England. So she was well versed in escape lines back to England. Anyway, to cut to the chase again, to get back to her mother and her trying to get out of France. They got down to the Bordeaux. They arrived separately because Mrs. Rowden became separated from Diana in the flood of people leaving Paris to escape down to Bordeaux. They eventually met up, and Mrs. Rowden was one of the very last to escape in a coal boat from Bordeaux back to England. As, as she was about to get on the boat, Diana broke the news to her that, um, I'm very sorry, Mama, but I can't return. I have got to stay behind. At that stage, Mrs. Rowden had no option but to go, but Diana promised her that she would try and get back to England as soon as she could. A little bit further down the track, Diana um, had no option but to return because Hitler said that any remaining Britons, they were going to get short shift and they were going to be rounded up and their way of life would have been drastically altered. So to cut a long story short, Diana escaped back to England through Spain and Portugal and arrived back in 1941. It was... It's incredible. She's been there nearly a year, though. She's nearly a year in fr- in France, Incredible. Yes, yes. Well, you see, she stayed in France, in in Paris, for an amazingly long time, really. You see, she had the ability. One one amazing thing about Diana, even though she was obviously, to look at her, very English, with her fair reddish hair and her blue eyes, but she had the ability to blend into the background. That was a huge thing, which obviously was going to hold her in good stead when she became an agent. Although people looking at her would have looked at her and thought, oh, she doesn't look French, you know, she's not dark. It's very fair, but she she had this strange ability on one hand to look as quintessentially English, but on the other hand, (laughs) very, very British. So anyway, she managed to, as I said, she managed to escape back to England. And as soon as she got back to England, what happened? She couldn't wait to get back to France. So anyway, she became a WAF. Her ability with languages was something that was picked up very quickly. But there seems to have been a, a period in which from the first time that it was picked up that Diana was a fluent French speaker to the time when she was actually had the first in- interview with Selwyn Jepsen, who was the recruiting officer for SOE. There was a gap there, which I was unable to 
find exactly what was the reason, but I did write about it briefly in the book. I said, well, she did have an operation at that time. She became, became unwell. It was apparently for appendicitis, so there must have been a period of recuperation. And during that time, people who were in the services used to recuperate at at a lovely place in Torquay and it was there that she met a very scarred and burnt pilot called William Simpson, Wing Commander William Simpson. Now he had spent quite a lot of time in France. He had been operated on. He was a fighter pilot. He'd crashed in France. He was rescued by the French, hidden and then given a series of, a series of op- operations, surgery by the French doctors. He had been given quite a bit of time in France to mull over the fact that he would like to do something for the world war effort. Well, he couldn't join the resistance because of his facial, um, the fact that he'd lost a hand and he was very badly burned. So, so he had no option but to escape to England. Anyway, he met up with Diana in this lovely place down in Torquay where injured servicemen and women went to recuperate. And they met up, they got along famously. William Simpson says, and he actually wrote about that time of meeting Diana, and he says he found Diana to be very calm, very poised, a lovely person, very strong in her desire to return to France, but also very frustrated, as was Simpson himself, that they couldn't return to France and do something to kick the Germans out. Simpson, of course, could not return at all because of his his, his burns and things like that. He he was involved in a small way with SOE, and he told Diana about it. And he said, look, he said, when you've recovered, go back. I will send a letter on to a person I know who recruits potential couriers and, and agents. So that was how Diana came to hear of SOE. I was quite surprised she hadn't been picked up earlier because one would have thought with her with her um, uh, solid public school sort of background and the fact she was you know multilingual and the fact she, she'd come in from France that... Uh, Almost that she hadn't picked up, but 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 perhaps SOE preferred people to have that um, uh, personal recommendation. Yes, uh, recommendation. Yes. yes, yes, exactly, exactly. And and I spent a long time poring all over her file, but there were gaps in um, the file, and I had to sort of put my thoughts into this by saying one reason could be was that she slipped through the net somehow. Um, there, there was a letter on file to say that Diana did not turn up um, to the interview first of all and because it was nearing the end of the year Mrs. Shrouden might have managed to persuade her and said look Diana you're just recovering from, the, from an operation. Please don't go back to France. It could have been a number of things. So, so it wasn't until 1942 that she actually met up with Selwyn Sel and Jepsen and it was obvious that she was first class material. The only thing that um, Sel and Jepsen was very worried about was that the fact that she looked English but she was perfect in every other way so she was accepted she then had to go on to a second interview before a board and the whole board were thrilled with the fact that she was multilingual and that she would be absolutely perfect but then again she looked English but at that time they were desperate they were desperate for more people do you think she was aware at this deal when do you when she goes through the interview process do you think how much of, aware, of an awareness do you think she had for what she was being interviewed for because presumably they they didn't really lay their cards on the table you were just interviewed well at that stage she didn't know what was in store for her because because they did say to her, um, I'm just going through, I've marked a couple of places here. What I say here is that uh, the board looked at the clear-eyed girl in wife uniform 
well, impeccable background, old army family, who RAF report described her as willing and cheerful. They were lucky to get her. Her initial interview had demonstrated her strength of character. She had a certain unobtrusiveness and manner. She wouldn't draw attention to herself. She would acquit herself perfectly, although the issue again raised itself that she would probably stand out like a sore thumb. But she was ideal in every way apart from not looking like a French woman. So they've told her about what her chances could be. All that she now had to do was to persuade her mother because um, the two women were, were very close. Her inception into SOE was May 1943, and at that stage, the tide of the war was beginning to turn. It was extremely dangerous. In France, where SOE were inserting more people, building more circuits, preparing for the invasion, carrying out sabotage, characters, uh, sorry, casualties were extremely high. And perhaps worst of all, at this time, I think you would probably have read about this, Angus, many agents had been dropped into Holland, had fallen straight into enemy hands as a result of the capture of British radios. Now, Diana did not know that. None of these young women had been told about that. They obviously knew that it was a dangerous time to be inserted into France, obviously, because because the Germans were on the lookout for agents. They knew that that the likelihood of the war, you know, it was going to turn, that the Allies were going to win. And, of course, France was a melting pot. It was full of uh, double agents, collaborators, um, uh, people who were, who, who were hand in glove with the Germans. So after she she had done her training, well, how do you, I mean? I mean, how I mean, how did her mother react to her being? I mean, could, how much was she allowed to even tell her family? Well, they weren't supposed to mention anything at all to their parents, mother, father, whatever, families, whatever. But I had letters saying saying that Mrs. Rudd knew about it, and and in conversations now with with the descendants of Diana and uh, Diana's family, they've all told me that they knew, but they didn't know anything else. Diana told her mother that she was going to go back to France because obviously they were close and, and, and maybe her mother guessed. Mrs. Arden was a strong, intelligent woman. You would know immediately if there's anything wrong with your daughter that, uh, you know, she come home in, in her uniform. And I guess it was just just obvious, but she only told her mother a small, a small amount. Um, her mother was fearful for, for her daughter's safety. And at that same time, both of her sons had joined up too. They had gone into the army. But I actually quote what Diana said to mother. She said, Mama, I have not gone into this without a great deal of thought. I realize you worry about, you're worried about me. And I would too if I was in your position. But I've seen firsthand what the Germans are capable of, and I know what the French are going through, They're suffering terribly. But you see, I'm not afraid. If I stayed, and it would be easy to do this, I'd feel that somehow I was shirking my duty. Try not worry too much. I know how to look after myself. And if I don't go, I'll be letting the side down. The sending in agents and wireless operators who don't know France that well some don't even speak the language properly. So you see, I've got to go and try and help in some way. But first I have to do my training, and that's going to take some weeks. And then she said, they, they mightn't even take me in the end. And Mrs. Rowden said, oh, they will, they will. And of course they did. <laughs> <laughs> because they were desperate, but also her, her training reports were a bit odd. They were, um, I'm just, I've marked some here. They said she was a strange mixture. One says that she does not seem to be of more than average intelligence and is not very quick. Um, her personality, although pleasant, is rather uninspiring. She has no particular powers of leadership and is not really capable of 
occupying a position which involved a lot of work, but she should be a reliable subordinate in carrying out a straightforward task. They're surprisingly average sort of comments, aren't they? Yes, yes. There is another one. She's a strange mixture, very intelligent in many ways, but very slow in learning any new subject, well-educated, reliable, and has courage. She should do well provided her job did not entail technical details or involved memory work. She hates being beaten by any subject, and her signalling has been a grief to herself, but... I think she has really enjoyed the course and could be useful. Also, another report said she's Mr. Arden is very fit, very good in field craft, and excellent with guns. I think she could be useful. That's. <laughs> I think she could be useful. Amazing. Um, <laughs> it, it's understatement, isn't it? It's an understatement, and also <laughs> the fact that she was a crack shot. She actually beat beat all the men. One of her uh, classmates at uh, Wamborough was uh, a French agent called Bob Malubia. He died when I was on the point of, of going to see him in France in 2015. But he was able to tell, tell me over the telephone before I left. He remembers Diana as a sweet girl, redhead and a bit spotty but with lovely blue eyes. She was a very strong person, very English in appearance and manner, and would generally wear a ribbon in her hair. She was one of the best students in our training group, better even than some of the men. She was very clear-headed, calm, not an excitable person. She excelled in everything she did in her training, except Morse. So that sort of gave gave another insight into her personality and her first training report bears out her progress with firearms. Somewhere in the past she had become a highly proficient shot, including grenades, and so impressed the training staff at Wanborough that it was noted that Miss Rowden is very fit, very good at field craft and excellent with guns and of course she um, she was passed. There has been over the years written in uh, in uh, many books the fact that maybe if we shouldn't have sent women in, they shouldn't have sent women in. But several books that I have read about about the same thing, including speaking to Noreen Riles, who's still alive, living in Paris, a British woman who would say um, she was one of the, she was actually a member of Morris Buck, Buckmaster staff. Morris ran is is a we. You'd have heard of Morris, wouldn't you? Yeah. yeah. Yes. Yes. And and um, so Noreen was one of his many secretaries, and and she would be carrying messages to and fro from from different people. And she said to me, all the women were satisfactory in training. They trained in classes with the men, and it was noticeable that they were much better than the men in many of the schools that the work required. Funnily enough, they took up pistol shooting with great ability. I, d- <laughs> I don't know what the psychological drive was out there, but there wasn't one of them who wasn't keen on it, even when the pistol was a forty five or automatic with a recoil so shattering that they would sometimes fall over. They would just get up and fire again. It was that sort of determination that was so impressive. So those sort of things are good, and and she's still alive to to tell the tale, you know. So they they decide to send her. It's to Jura, which is uh, it's um on the east east of France, is it sort of over towards the Swiss border. Am I right? Right on the Swiss border, just just before the Swiss border is yes. a beautiful part, a part that that I um, wanted to tell tell you the reason why it was such a a marvelous part because because it's an area of mountains and a perfect place for the Mackey and they they had a big solid Mackey environment there. So she was heading for the uh, the French Comte region of the Jura, an area of wild mountains and deep pine forests. It was an area strongly patriotic 
and full of resistance with one idea in their minds to rid the country of the damn Bosch. So it's so she's going into a solid environment. It was nowhere near as dangerous as Paris, for for instance, which was full of Germans and full of Nazis. Although, of course, the biggest town in uh, the Jura is is Lons Le Saunier, and they had a solid Gestapo head headquarters there. I've I've actually um, seen it, and it's still there to this day. So that was a dangerous area. But but Diana wasn't. You know, she didn't go into Lawn straight away. She was eased, eased into this area. I mean, one of the reasons she's eased in is because I, I, there's a, there's an idea that you flew the agents into the area, but I mean, it must be so far over France. They dropped her. She came in six hundred miles away in a little Lysander, because presumably the planes wouldn't want to fly that far over occupied France. So they'd fly to the French somewhere close and get out again. They were all flowing into the same area, a place called Angers, which was the only area where the little Lysanders could, could land. And it was run by, obviously, double agent, maybe even triple agent, Henri Derecourt. Of course, he was in charge of all the Lysander operations coming in um, from um, the Suffolk. Someone, I think it was George Miller, um, English SOE agent, said that he ran it almost like like running a bus. You know, the the, the operations were almost every night over the moon period. So they were coming and going. They were dropping agents. They were picking up people to go back to England. They were dropping them off. But of course, Belanger was a long way away from from the Jura. So first of all, Diana and and her three other companions that night, one of whom was Noor Inayat Khan, they had first of all they had to go to Paris. Now, Dara course supplied the agents with bicycles. That gave off um, would have told them you know, which direction Paris lay. So they went to Paris. They all went their separate ways. Diana picked up a train from the station at Angers, and then they had to go into Montparnasse, and then she had to get off at Montparnasse, then she had to go into Paris, and then she left from her long uh, journey to the Jura, which would have taken all day because she had to get off trains and there were there was always delays as it was wartime. The Allies had probably um, many times they came and they bombed the tracks or, or us even the local resistance used to bomb the tracks. So to get from A to B was nowhere near what it would be like today where you'd go straight through. There was always delays. But eventually she arrived in the little village where she was due to meet up with John Starr, who uh, was established there. But John Starr had actually been arrested and she was due to meet up with her radio operator, John Young. And uh, they arranged to meet up in the little village of St. Amour, it was there that she met the person in charge of the, of the local resistance, Henri Claire, and um, his his wife, Yvonne. Now, Yvonne is still alive, and, and I met her in 2015 when I was researching Diana. Her husband had died during the 1970s, but Yvonne has got very, very clear memories of what happened, she became very close to Diana. They were practically the same age, and Diana lived with him um, for quite a long time, and she was able to go out with Yvonne's husband to very, for various drops of arms. Um, she was able to use the Claire's home as a base, and she met a lot of the resistance. So she was able to work from there for quite a long time until the Germans knew that the Claire's were part of the resistance. And at that stage, they knew that they were running to British agents. So then Diana had to move on. But then she was relatively successful for a short, you know, I said for the period of time that she was operational, she seemed to have been relatively successful, being able to think on her feet. And I think she was running messages to and from... Um, 
Sorry, it's John, it's John Young, her radio operator, wasn't she? Was actually it's the go between. Yes, 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 radio operator. John Young couldn't be left to, um, although he was a very, very good operator and, and uh, could speak French because before the war he had married a French woman and um, he was a travelling salesman. But he spoke French with the most appalling British accent, absolutely appalling, so he couldn't be let loose. <laughs> so we when Diana was was with John Young, say for instance, in the, the, um, the village, she did all the talking. But actually, Diana was sent all over France. She went to Lyon, Besançon, Montpellier, even as far as Marseille as a courier. Activities much wider than those of an ordinary courier. She became the sole link between all the agents in the Jura region and was very careful to be extra vig- vigilant in Paris on the times when she had to go up to Paris for some region, um, reason or other, because Paris was a powder keg, alive with the informants um, for the Gestapo. And there's always the thought, could any of the so-called friends or agents, could they be trusted? She'd been told not to talk on trains, even in the company of local resistance. Uh, even local Frenchmen could not be trusted. There could be an informer working in the local cafe, for instance, and if somebody had hung a portrait of Picard, then one could be fairly certain that the owner of the cafe wasn't a resistance. So, in other words, she had to remain calm, which, of course, she was. She was an essentially very calm person. She didn't rush at doing anything. She took her time. But her work was physically demanding, made all the more difficult by the constant presence of German roadblocks. It is most probable that she would have taken messages to uh, to one of her Lysander um, companions, Charles Skepper, who was running the monk circuit in Marseille at the time. And uh, uh, she would have met Charles, of course, prior to them embarking on the Lysander sent a trip into France and she knew after all, Diana knew the um, the area of the south of France very well because she'd been living there as a child for seven or so years but on one of her trips to Marseille, Diana had an extremely close escape her train was suddenly boarded by the German police in the process of one of their frequent checks and they demanded to see the passengers identification papers she was very, very worried uh, because obviously all the, Eng- the British agents in France were all carrying forged papers. But there was always the worry that the Gestapo would see through them. Now, one of the big mistakes is even people nowadays, people say, oh, the Germans, you know, they went through bride. They make jokes about them. They're not very adaptable. And, you know, the Nazi soldiers, they were, were indoctrinated and, you know, that sort of thing. But it was a mistake because they weren't stupid. The Germans had sent the people into France who were intelligent They were taught how to recognize possible agents. They could speak the language very well, and it was a mistake to look on them as buffoons. But the actual Germans living in France weren't. Anyway, on on, uh, this this particular instance that I wrote about, Diana had to lock herself in the toilet. They boarded the train very, very quickly. There was no option. She knew that she looked English and she was ter- terribly worried about the about her papers. So she just locked herself in the nearest toilet, which, which luckily enough was vacant. And do you know what? The Germans didn't even try the toilet door. You wouldn't believe it. Well, obviously, look, if they tried and found it locked, you'd have thought that that they would have ordered the person inside to have come out. But for some reason, nothing happened. And at the next stop, when the st- um, when the the train slowed down, Diana made her escape and um, eventually made her way back to the to the Jura. She was in the Jura for a period of just under six months, but. She did a lot of good. She was she was an amazing woman. You, you say about the you know, the competency competency of the Germans. Certainly, 
you know, when 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 the house of cards comes comes tumbling tumbling down and they're picked up, it's an excellent ruse that they quite simply pick them up with by you know the the the, the, the French seem relatively lax on their um, security procedures that they've put in place. It's true, true. But I think one has got to realise that the conditions in France at uh, the time. There were so many different, for want of a, want of a better word, there's so many different types of French people. You would have had to have been absolutely stupid if you had completely antagonised any German. You would have been arrested straight away. They were the ordinary people who were trying to just live the best they could to, to take care of their families. There were the other ones who were the collaborators. There were a certain type of French resistance person who didn't care if they were caught. The end justified the means. You never really knew. And, and even people who, who were demonstrated a lack of support for for the British were in effect the opposite. It was like a melting pot, and it must have been terribly difficult for the agents. Even people that they were told that they could trust turned out that they were working for the Germans. So, in other words, you couldn't trust anyone. You just couldn't trust old Mrs. Martel, who 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 was working in the bakery. You just couldn't even trust her because she could have been being paid by a German sympathiser or, or even a Gestapo. I think Diana, working and living in the Jura, it was the best out of a bad job, you know. She wasn't living in Paris where every second person was a um, was an informer. She was living in a relatively, or as near as possible, a relatively safe part of France. Even though the longer she stayed there, the more dangerous it became for her, until inevitably, of course, this double agent was flowing in in uh, November, and who came to the house. By this stage, she was living with Eugenia de Debris and as uh, a last port of call, as was John Young. But previously to that, they had been living in this beautiful chateau that also that I went to to see, and it was so far out, out of the way that you just couldn't imagine the Germans taking the long haul up to it. But even that was blown in the end. And as soon as that, that was blown, the Clares put John Young and told them about the, the house of the Janier Debris, the owner of which Raoul Janier Debris had his own little resistance cell and um, his brothers, the whole family, were resistance supporters, so they knew that they were safe there. And Diana, for the first time, must have felt, oh, I'm safe, the end of the war isn't too far away. Perhaps she thought that she was going to survive. Now, two descendants of the Chania Debris family, one, um, Christiane and Claude, who, who have become very friendly with me and who have told me so much about that time, they were just young children at, at that stage. But Christiane, the older of the two, clearly remembers Diana, and um, she said they will never forget her. One of the most poignant things that she told me one that I haven't been able to forget was the fact that she remembers her mother calling the children and Diana would often help her her mother look after the two children because Mrs. Um, Jenny Debris was expecting her, her third child and Diana had, um, she would, you know, look after the children so her mother could get on with the cooking and the shopping and generally carrying the, the third child. The Janier Debris uh, family ran a saw, sawmill and the whole family lived in this little upstairs, downstairs. It was it, it looked like a Swiss sort of um, a chalet type of thing, but the whole family lived there and it was adjacent to the sawmill. Well, at the end of the day's work, the children played on the floor and amongst the the sawdust and Christiane Janier Debris 
told me, she said, she said, my clearest memory of Diana, the one that stands out more than anything, was my um, um, hearing my mother say, come, you must come home now, Claude and Christiane, and Diana picking her up, and Diana used to wear these beautiful black expensive shoes, and she said, Diana picked me up in one hand and Claude in the other, and I looked down and I saw the footprints in, in uh, the sawdust. And she said it stayed with her. She said she's never forgotten. It somehow seems poignant to uh, to link that with their sort of incarceration, really, the chapters in the Zodas, because it is a, uh, well, their final incarceration as they as they get passed through the system is is oh, there's, there's so many chapters to, to, to Diana's life. She's just picked, they're picked up with a with a fake fake Benoit. And then they're, I mean, are they interrogated once once they're picked up? I mean, I don't know how rough the Germans got with the women. Actually, uh, before the final capture, before the uh, the Germans, the uh, Gestapo, and uh, were rounded up and they banged on the door and fired through the ceiling and, and before that kerfluffle happened, Diana was actually caught in uh, Lons Le Sonia one day. Now, it was before she went to stay with Eugenia de Bries. She was staying in uh, the little village of Epi, which I have also seen too, and, and she was living with a madam, Rutu, um, Rathaus, I think it's pronounced, it's, uh, it's, it's, I'm not too sure of the pronunciation, but she did hairdressing on the side, but she was also, she ran the local pizzerie, it's a very, very tiny village, so in a village that size you would know everyone. So anyway, she sent Diana one day, well under the pretense of buying groceries, but it was really to pass a message to um, to several other resistants in uh, Lons Le Saunier. And as I've said before, it's the biggest town in the, the Jura, and, and it had a local Gestapo headquarters, and of course it was very, very dangerous. Dangerous. On this particular day, the Germans were running a Rafael. They would bring people in off the street. They had no reason. They just decided to do it, maybe to see if they would be lucky enough to picking up an agent because they knew two agents, two British agents, were living, were working in the area of the Jura. One they knew was a woman and the other one was a man. At, at that stage, they didn't have any descriptions of them. But they did know that, that the British woman was called Paulette, and that was uh, Diana's alias. So this day, Diana, unfortunately, she had Diana taken every precaution possible. She had dyed her hair, she had worn different clothes, so she no longer looked like the, the English woman that she looked before. Diana was taken with a group of these people into the uh, police station at, at Lons. She was interrogated. I think she was interrogated over the night. She was interrogated two or three times, but they could not break her story because she had been well versed in Bewley. They all, each agent had a cover story and they had gone over that time and time again. Diana, of course, excellent French. The cover stories that the SOE instructors had given their would-be agents were based as much as possible on their early life. So if they forgot a minor thing, it didn't matter. Uh, for instance, Diana had lived in the south of France, and this is what she told her in Perigata. She had lost her father, which was true, but she kept to her alias, which was not Paulette, obviously, but her name was Juliette Rondeau, so she said that was her name. In other words, they couldn't break her, so they decided to let her go. But one of the, one of the uh, Germans had said to her, well, what are you doing in, in the Lons, Lons of uh, Sony? And, and she said, well, I've been, I've been very sick, um, but, but I'm working for my aunt, and we needed some fresh vegetables, and she's running a shop, and, and this is her livelihood. The interrogator said, well, how, how do I know that you aren't a member of, of the resistance? And Diana, very calm, very cool-headed, unflustered, said, oh, um, a monsieur, um, um, I couldn't possibly. I, 
I have been sick. I do not have the energy to run around after the resistance. And uh, they looked at her and, and obviously they could see she was very pale and tired. And they let her go. She'd sailed too close to the wind and it was after that that she left Epi and that was when she went straight to the Chenier de Bries in um, the little village of clairvaux le lac That's now where Claude Chenier de Bries lives and where I've stayed. Yeah, and she'd be cycling around all these, all these places, be very evocative. Gosh, they had to cycle for miles, or at least Diana had to cycle for miles. John Young was locked away in the chateau, miles and miles and miles away from people. They couldn't even come out during the day. They could only come out at night and, you know, living like that, day after day, week after week, knowing that at any time the Gestapo, the Germans, could have could have got them, you know, could have found them. The isolation, the living, living was a fact that you could be caught um, any day. Modern people would have no idea what it was mm. like. A constant, constant fear of being picked up. Absolutely. That, that, would this, you know, waking up in the morning, would this, would this be our last day? What what's going to happen? Are they going to torture me? Am I going to be able to withstand torture? And if I do withstand, what is going to happen to me? Am I going to be shot? Am I going to be thrown into a German concentration camp? What's going to be the outcome? Am I ever going to see my family again? And living also with the constant fear is, is the torture. Am I going to be tortured so as I start screaming out names, dates? Um, other agents. Can you imagine? And and this is a woman of 29 years of age who had been brought up with with servants, um, money, and and that sort of thing. But this this is sort of one of the things that that sort of led me to do her story. Now, Diane, now Diana's story, you know, from when she's when she's picked up, could well have been could well have been lost. But it's Vera Atkins who, after the war. Uh, Vera was she did she run the female operations for F section? She goes back after the war and for SOE, yes. For SOE, sorry. And she doggedly tracks down what happens to the the missing girls that were picked up. If it hadn't been from some for someone called one of the male agents, a Netzweiler, uh well, there were two actually. One was Brian Stonehouse, an artist who had been captured, I think, in 1942. He was part of a working group that day on the 6th of July who saw these four women arrive about 3 o'clock during the afternoon of, of July the 6th. They stood out like sore thumbs because this was a male camp. There were no female prisoners. They all wondered... What on earth was happening? What are these four women here for? A rumour started to go around the camp. Oh, OK, there's going to be a brothel set up, and these are obviously four, four, four poor women that are either prostitutes or something from Paris or us, or us, if not that, they are going to come in for the, for the pleasure of the Germans, you know, party girls or whatever. Within a matter of hours, I think at six, seven o'clock that evening, another rumour went through the camp that it was quite obvious that, that they were going to be killed there because even though there were thousands in um, the camp, it wasn't spread over acres and acres. It was contained in a fairly small I don't know the dimensions of the camp, but it wasn't like one of uh, uh, some concentration camps on German soil that went for miles and miles. Everything was sort of contained. And, of course, the men were all in barracks. Actually, one of the um, a Belgian SRE um, person who had actually won, run an escape line, Albert Gerius, he managed to speak to one of the the women and it was now we don't know whether or not it was was Diana but it must have been him because he he threw a stone up against the wall the woman um 
we were imprisoned in a sort of barrack, but it must have been because the camp is built on tiers. They went further down where the rooms where where there were the, where there was a crematorium and the, and the the rooms where they did experimentations on the prisoners. So Albert Garius threw a stone up to the window where he saw a face come came at the window, and he called up and he said, "Are you French or or English?" And the woman said, "I am English or I am British." Now. Obviously, it must have been Diana because she was the only English person amongst those four women. But of course, we don't know because um, Vera Lee also she was half English and half French, so it may have been her. To get back to what I was saying, it was very clear that the women there were, were there for sinister reasons, and and it became obvious that. Um, something was was going to happen. And then when they saw the gusts of smoke come out um, of the chimneys about 8 o'clock that night, um, they knew that something terrible had had happened to the woman. I mean, it is... Oh, it's quite, as, you know, it's, as a religion, it's, it, it's thanks to Vera Atkins, really, who goes back and, and tracks all this down. Who is it, it's quite re- remarkable, her journey at the end of the war of, of tenaciously tracking down what had happened to these these women that were were just missing, dropped off the radar. Yes, well, the plan before they went was that they would meet in Paris when the war ended, and they began trickling through, but there were still quite a few agents who who didn't um, trickle through. She thought to herself, um, she she was a wonderful woman really because um she used her own money, she she knocked on doors, she she was determined to go to to Germany and and France and, and to see what happened to her lost woman agent. Now she knew Brian Stonehouse and Brian Stonehouse in the company of Bob Shepherd, another agent, they came back to England and um, once they they uh, recovered, Brian made contact with Vera. Now, Vera at that stage had no idea what Brian had seen, and it wasn't until he mentioned that one day he'd seen these four women arriving in the camp. And, of course, Vera questioned him. He supplied an affidavit. He described to it. Vera said... Could you draw these women? Brian was an artist before the war, so he drew them. And it's a very famous painting now now on in the Special Forces Club in uh, London, this painting of the four women. And this is an aside, but I tried everything I could to get permission from the Brian Stonehouse estate that I could have a copy um, of of the painting that I could get it into my book somehow, but the person running the estate, not Brian's family, but somehow connected, she just wouldn't give permission. But Brian's sister, who lives in New York, gave me a copy of his sketch that he did. It was a sketch that he gave. Vera Atkins, and it wasn't until later that he did his painting of the four women uh, going down this, um, the steps down to the crematorium with a, a German coming behind them in the rear and one coming, you know, in front of them. Anyway, um, to get back to your question, yes, Vera Atkins, when she saw and read the affidavit that Brian Stonehouse has said and who described, immediately she knew one was Diana because Brian said there was a patently British woman uh, with fair hair with a, a ribbon in her hair. And Vera knew that Diana always wore a tartan ribbon in her hair. She couldn't find <laughs> the others. It took her some time to realise who who they were. One she was convinced was Noor Eniak Khan, but that, of course, wasn't her. So the woman that she thought was Noor Khan, uh, of course, was 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 Sonia Olszewski, who was physically very 
much um, um, like like Noor. So, so Vera, anyway, it took her a long time. The Royal Air Force flew her to Germany. She interviewed some Germans, and um, finally the Netzweiler case came to trial because a lot of the men at the camp, a lot survived, a lot didn't, but the ones who survived wrote effort, effort Davids and gave the names of uh, the murderers at, at the camp. And the Netzweiler um, trial was very famous, 1946. Vera painstakingly, at her own expense, did this wonderful job of finding her lost woman agents. It is. It was remarkable. I only, I only really have one one question. You know, to, to sort of close the file on, on, on things is, is it's a matter. Of, it has been a remarkable story. But how much did her family ever find out about the act, her activities during the war? I mean, I presume they weren't kept appraised of what was going on once she was in the field. I mean, were they just? Was it just silence to the families once they were? It was absolutely disgraceful. Dinah's father had died in 1935, so so it was just her mother. Now, I've just made notes of this because I want to be absolutely certain. On page 239 in uh, my book, uh, um, Dinah was awarded two, uh, two awards, uh, the Choir de Guerre and the, and the member of the Order of the British Family. It was not until 1946 that Mrs. Rowden learned that her daughter had been awarded these two decorations. She had heard virtually nothing of her daughter's service, and she was under the impression that Diana had failed. Now, can you imagine, just just can you imagine, you know, she waited a long time before it it was um, obvious that, that Diana had failed. It wasn't going to come back. Mrs. Rowden read in the paper that Nor Inyat Khan, Yolan Beekman, and Eliane Pluman had been awarded posthumous choir de guerre. It was over to Elizabeth Nicholas, who met up with Mrs. Rowden during the 1950s, to find out exactly why Diana's name had never been mentioned. Um, Elizabeth Nicholas thought in the 1950s that surely Diana too had been decorated, but she'd said nothing to Mrs. Rowden in case she was mistaken. Nicholas asked the, the Fannies if, if they would approach the military attaché at the French embassy to inquire if Diana had been awarded a choir de guerre. Because although in 1946, uh, sorry, in 1945, two posthumous awards had been awarded to Diana, Mrs. Rowden hadn't been informed. This, this is disgraceful. This is just one of the things that that I found that I just couldn't accept when when uh, writing about Diana. So it wasn't until October 1955 that Mrs. Rowden finally received the Croix de Guerre, which had been awarded awarded to her daughter in January 1946. And when it became known in the, in the village where Mrs. Rowden lived, it was picked up by the local paper and also by the London Star in 1945, in 1955, and I quote, through a confusion in the records, it was not until this week, November 1955, that Mrs. Rowden learned of the award of the Choir de Guerre to her daughter. A confusion in the records is one way of describing a disgraceful turn of affairs. Dame Irene Ward, MP, and a pen friend of Elizabeth Nicholas decided not to let the matter rest. She made inquiries out of how this had happened, and when the answer came, it was indeed incredible. In 1942, the Committee on the Grant of Honours, Decorations and Medals in Time of War recommended that posthumous awards confirmed on British service 
personnel by foreign governments should not be accepted. The reason given was that some foreign governments issued posthumous awards much more freely than did the British government. And if they had accepted posthumous awards made by foreign governments, they would have been unable to reciprocate. So, one question remained. If Diana's award had been sent back to the French, why were Eliane Plumans and Eliane Beekman's confirmed? Their families had been awarded, had been informed about the awards, and Mrs. Rowden was not. So by this time, Elizabeth Nicholas was fuming, had made no bones about calling the whole thing a miserable, squalid affair. Mrs. Rowden had not been bitter, but she'd been saddened that some of the women who had shared danger with her daughter had received the choir de gear while Diana had got nothing. It's absolutely disgraceful. You wouldn't believe it. And it sort of ties in with the fact that so little has been written about Diana for goodness sake, now, since my book um, has has come out, on one part, I was incredibly lucky that that the write-up about the book um, was was um, put in most of the major newspapers, like, um, you know, the Daily Mail, blah, blah, the Mirror, the Sun, blah, blah. But with all the comments, you know how articles are written now and people are allowed to comment, there was over 600 people, uh, 600 comments and I don't know, 300 odd shares, whatever, on Facebook and all the, and, and all blah, blah on social media. But the one thing comes through is how come none, no one has heard of Diana Rowden? Why hasn't this, this been mentioned before? Why is there so much about Violet Sabo um, and uh, the other ones, Noor Khan, um, uh, the Polish girl, Christina Skarbek, people like that? For goodness sake, Diana was, if not the only English girl, the only British girl, um, there may have been one more who, who I, I have been able to track down, why, what is there about the British? They don't lord their own. And this is something that I must ask you about. Why has this happened? Why did it take a Kiwi from thousands of miles away in New Zealand to write about a British girl, to find out about it? If the narrative has been overtaken by the fact that some of those who got back wrote the stories and those have, stories have really been the basis for... Uh, the, 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 uh, are the popular imagination. So perhaps those who never have got back and have not appeared in those stories are the ones that have have have, have sort of been marginalised. And it's not that they've not done anything as uh, as worthy. It's just that there's nobody been championing them until you've come along. <laughs> you know, World War Two now is extremely. It's, it's you know, the books, people are churning the books out. They're making the movies. They're making the documentaries. There's, um, there's a lot of files who, who, which have been released. There's no excuse for this. Um, um, I feel strongly about this. You know, I really do. You know, I mean, it's not only Diana that I'm thinking of. There would have to be some other SRE people that that haven't haven't had their books written about them. But I feel Diana was an exceptional person, and the very fact, the tragedy that that happened to Mrs. Rowden, and she went on, of course, to lose both her sons as well. Um, the, the, what was there about the Rowdens? The whole family, th this whole story is so tragic. And I'm on the um, the verge of writing to Princess Anne, who's the patron of the Special Forces Club, to uh, to ask, could she please take up what I feel would be very worthy? I feel Diana is worthy of a memorial. Now, her name is, of course, mentioned on several plaques and things, she's uh, she's one of the four and on the wall of the Netzweiler Crematorium. There's a thing in London. She's one of the ones who died for their country. But there's a big statue in, in Hyde Park, uh, Violet Sabo, Odette's got one, Christina Scarbett's got a sculpture. For goodness sake, 
get your own house in order before you start doing the foreigners. Now, now that sounds awful. I, I don't mean it to say that, but why can't the British do something about the English, um, the wonderful, courageous people who who just put their life life on the line? To me, it's it's it's. I don't know. It, it's uh, I can't fathom it out. Newspapers and uh, journalists here in New Zealand keep asking me this question, and I say, "Well, I don't know. It's possibly that no one has has taken the bull by the horns and and done anything about it." I'm not denigrating any of those other wonderful women like Violet Sabo and and Odette and Noor. They were wonderful. It's it's just that um, do the Brits first, you know, the courage of someone like like Diana Rodden and and some of the English. They they were wonderful. No one forced them to go to France or to Norway or to to wherever they they went. The the wonderful brave people and and let's get a memorial to 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 Diana first and and then. Uh, the people in France and the Jura say, well, why, you know, if you're going to do one of Diana, include all the the the, the French resistance and uh, the Jura as well. And I say, okay, you will have to help me about that, but Diana is my main concern. I'll do her first, and then <laughs> and then and then we will look at at getting um, parks or memorials set up to the others. Of which, of course, John John Young is one. Um, there's always a bit of dubious worries about John Starr, who some say threw in their lot with the Germans. We will never really know the whole story. But look, even if he did, why would you denigrate someone who, who gave into torture? I mean, you don't know what a lot of these people... Did. I mean, someone's got their breaking point. You can't say he lacked courage. Well, no one lacks courage who's prepared to go in into a little light plane one dark night and going into a foreign country which is overrun by the enemy. That isn't a sign of 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 someone lacking courage, is it? Absolutely not. Absolutely not. The bravery of these men and women is is uh, is remarkable. Gabriella, that that would seem like a, a good place to finish. Um, th- thank you for your time. So, listeners, if you like to read the whole story of Diana Rowden, Gabriella's book is Her Finest Hour: The Heroic Life of Diana Rowden, Wartime Secret Agent. It takes the reader through Diana's life. I have a link on the website. And don't forget, loyal listener, you may not have a dollar to spare to become a patron, but you can help support the show in a small way by buying books from Amazon by clicking on the links on the podcast website. That's www.podcast.com. It's been a longer episode this time out, and that's been made possible by listeners like yourself helping me to increase my hosting package. So it's a big thank you to all those who support the podcast on Patreon. That's patreon.com slash www.podcast or from Donate on the website. I think we're in the Pacific for the next episode. Um, So until then, I'm Angus Wallace, and thanks for listening.